Hey, good morning. Hey, join me in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18. While you're getting there, boy, isn't God good? I mean, we just sang about the goodness of our God. And, you know, the other, the other uh, night we were watching The Chosen. You ever watching The Chosen? You know what I'm talking about there? And there was this scene where in, in season three, I think I can say this with no spoilers, because if you've read the Gospels, there are no spoilers in the show. But anyway, um, uh, it's this part where the disciples are about to go out two by two. You know, Jesus is sending them out two by two. And they're gathered in front of Matthew's house, and they've got their arms doing this. And boy, it's like a, it's like a snow globe they're doing, you know. And, and they're rolling this way with each other, and they're quoting scripture together. And uh, my daughter looks at me, and she says, you know what? Because there's a Roman soldier over here watching them. And she looks at me, and she says, you know what? I can see where the world would think Christians are weird. <laughs> and I'm like, I know. <laughs> because we are a peculiar people. I mean, we are the people on this planet whose lives can be falling apart and still say, we're going to sing of the goodness of God. I mean, our lives can be broken, and we're still singing of the goodness of God. We're still gathering together to see how we can spread the love of God, even when we ourselves are struggling to love someone else or whatever else. We can still praise the God for who he is. We're supposed to do that. We're supposed to look different than the world does. We're supposed, we're the called out ones, right? That's what the church means. We're the ones who are sharing and showing what the kingdom of God looks like on this earth. That's you and me, guys. And that's why we're doing this uh, series right here, Jesus the Teacher, right? We're in part three of Jesus the Teacher. And so far we've seen why we must build our, our lives on his teachings, how he explained what salvation is and not just the stuff we come up with for it, right? But we saw last week that he brings salvation, what he taught about it. It's very different than what we hear in the world, but again, it's supposed to be. His teaching as we see Jesus the teacher, if we're going to say he's Lord and we're going to say he's Savior, we have to also say he's teacher. He tells us what to believe. He teaches us about life in his kingdom. And it will look differently than what the world's kingdom looks like. You know, it's almost like we live in a different culture. We're from a different culture. You know, have you ever, I love getting around and talking to people from a different country or, or even just maybe different parts of the United States. You know, as we come together and we're like, hey, man, this is what I do in my culture. And, and we explain, hey, I do things this way. In the South, we fry everything. <laughs> you know? And somebody from the Midwest is like, why would you do that? You're supposed to barbecue it. You know? And then you get these other things coming in. But, you know, in our world, we're going to hear things about marriage. And we have to say, you know, in my culture, it's different. We're going to hear things about greatness how are you, what, what constitutes a great person? And we're, they're going to tell us, oh, it's about strength, and it's about money, and it's about, and we're going to say, you know, in my culture, we view that differently. Because we are of a different culture, right? We are of a different people. And sometimes <laughs> we're going to um, be misunderstood. Sometimes we're going to be thought of as weak. We're going to be thought of as crazy. We're going to be thought of as intolerant. We're going to be thought of as hateful. We're going to be thought of as, as whatever else. And sometimes we're even going to suffer for it. Because let's take another step into this reality. Sometimes we're going to be hurt, right? And sometimes that hurt is going to come from within the kingdom. We're going to hurt each other, guys. Believers are going to offend other believers, and in those moments, the culture is going to look and say, where's all that teaching now? Where's all that life that you say you believe now? And when we suffer, especially when we suffer wrongdoing at the hands of other believers, guys, it is time to reflect a kingdom response to that injury, meaning forgiveness. And that's where we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 18, right? Uh, this morning, we're going to dive right into what Jesus taught us about forgiveness, because we need to understand forgiveness. Uh, one article, this is, this is how we're understanding forgiveness right now. One article on a, uh, a website I like to go to to read Christian articles, right? Whenever you hear me go, I read this article. This is one of those websites, right? And I typed in the search bar on the website, forgiveness. And the only article that popped up was 38 ways to pray for your husband. <laughs> and since I don't have a husband, I turn that thing off. <laughs> so... I don't know, maybe, how, how are we getting forgiveness here? Because forgiveness, we've got to understand it because it is probably the hardest 
thing that Jesus actually commands us to do. Because this one's going to cost us something. So we look at the culture. What does the culture say about forgiveness? Okay, basically the culture on forgiveness, you get one of two things. Joe on the street. Okay, average Joe on the street says, don't do it. Don't forgive people. Yeah, why would you do that? They hurt you, you go get them back. You type about them in all capital letters on social media, but passive aggressively, so no one really knows who you're talking about except them. <laughs> Guys, if you're at war with them, what makes you think they're on your social media anyway? <laughs> yeah, but anyway, well, maybe they're stalking you, you're stalking them, this got into a stalk, okay, rabbit trail. Anyways, but that's what we hear from them, right? I mean, it's, it's a big thing about we can't do this. They, you got to ruin them. If you forgive them, that means you gave in. You let them win, and they can't win, right? So we're not going to let it bother us, and yet it does. We start to define ourselves by what they did to us because we're going to make sure it never happens again, right? We're going to be strong. We're going we're to hold that bitterness. We're going to hold that hate. That's what Joe on the street would say. What about the professional community? The professional community says, yeah, you should probably forgive people. And by professional community, I mean the medical field, the psychological field, all these people. Here's what they say. Multiple studies, multiple studies link bitterness, right? That's unforgiveness. We link bitterness to increased feelings of stress, enhanced anxiety, depression, psychiatric disorders, uh, and more negative health symptoms overall. I mean, think about that for a second. In other words, when we're holding bitterness in us, it is affecting us physically and emotionally. A report from Johns Hopkins University entitled, Forgiveness, Your Health Depends on It, says, I'm going to read this, the good news about all that anxiety stuff, the good news, studies have found that the act of forgiveness can reap huge rewards for your health, lowering the risk of heart attack, improving cholesterol levels and sleep, reducing pain, blood pressure, and levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. Good news. And that's coming from, catch this, one of the most respected research universities on the planet. And they're saying for these things like anxiety and depression, all that, medicine may not be as necessary as just forgiving somebody. Hold that thought. Because the Journal of American College of Cardiology finds that feelings of anger and hostility increase the risk and severity of heart disease, especially among men. That's why we need you ladies praying for us in 38 different ways. <laughs> but they even go as far as to say that in treating heart disease, they ought to look into the, psycho the, the psychology of bitterness and anger as well. Guys, grab that. The, the article goes on to say that unforgiveness creates an emotional storm of distress in which feelings of stress, anxiety, depression, insecurity, and fear surface. It creates a hardened heart that is consumed by hatred toward the offender, and it sets the body in a state of chaos. That's what bitterness and unforgiveness do. Now, you may be thinking, how do we get such extremes on that where Joe on the street saying, nah, get him, get him. And uh, the medical and all that community is going, yeah, you should probably forgive people because it's good for you. How do we get such a big chasm there? Why, if, if it's really that good for our health, and I see a lot of people out there nodding, you're tracking what I'm saying, why don't we forgive people? I mean, why, are we having, why, are, why do we resist forgiving people so much? Well, we resist forgiving people for a lot of different reasons. Number one is good old-fashioned pride, right? I mean, think about it this way. They hurt me. I'm not letting them get away with this. If I forgive them, then they get away with it. We're not going to have this, you know? It's almost like I'm admitting defeat if I let them go. And let's be honest. When we have bitterness in our hearts, it gives us a feeling of power over somebody else. they got to make it up to me. They've got to they gotta come to me and, and make it right. Maybe number two is we're still hurt, you know? I mean, it still hurts. They're out here walking scot-free, and here I am still paying the price. I'm the one that's hurt. I'm the one trying to put my life back together. I will forgive them when I get over it. Well, what we're going to find out in a few minutes is actually the opposite is true. You cannot move beyond it until you forgive. Because as we hold bitterness, what we are doing is we're forcing ourselves to relive the offense over and over and over again. You can't get beyond it until you flush it. How about they're not sorry? They haven't changed. 
They've never come to me and apologized yet. What, do you need their forgiveness to forgive them? I mean, you need their permission to forgive them? But we sit there and we do that. Well, they haven't said they're sorry. They're, they're not there. Number one, you're assuming that they understand how deeply they hurt you. Sometimes we don't. You know, Sometimes we have no idea how badly we've hurt somebody. And we see that person kind of going on with their lives. They've separated themselves from us. We don't understand how deeply the hurt has gone. And on the flip side, it's not about what they do anyways. But what we want is them to come and apologize and change so that we feel validated in our bitterness. We want to feel like, yeah, we, we, they got to admit they're wrong. I think another reason is we have a wrong view of forgiveness. We think forgiveness is some kind of toxic um, toxic positivity, right? It's almost like a no worries. Hey, it's okay. They didn't, it wasn't that bad. It's not that big of a deal. I'm going to go on about my business. Only love, only good vibes. I'm going to have a good time. I'm going to pray for my wife 38 ways. Actually, I'm going to go beyond 39 ways. You know, that's how we, we operate though. We think of it as it's just a thing. We're just going to move on. We're not going to let it affect us. But the reality is it does affect us. Nobody is arguing that sin against us doesn't hurt, right? So it's not that we just move beyond it and ignore pain. It's not that. Nor is it that they're going to get away with it. It doesn't mean that there's no justice. It doesn't mean that, that, that they're not going to pay a price eventually, right? Or even uh, legally if that's what's happened. Forgiveness at its core is simply me releasing the offender from any obligation to come make it up to me. That's what forgiveness is. It's not saying that, that I'm going to, uh, we're, we're going to be BFFs now. You know, it's not saying that all things are going to be great and, and boy, I'm going to, yeah, that's not what it's saying. Forgiveness is releasing an offender from any obligation to pay you back. So it doesn't mean there's no justice. It's not a sign of weakness because only the strong can actually forgive. You know, it takes a sacrifice to forgive. It takes strength to forgive. I would argue to say the weak are the ones who can't forgive because they can't put their trust in something greater than themselves. And just be honest, guys, almost everything is greater than us. Or maybe this one. We don't know how to forgive or why we should. You know, we just don't know how. How do we get to that point of, of releasing this, this burden? I mean, how do we get to this point where we no longer feel hate? How do we get to the point where we can trust that life's going to get better? How do we get to the point where I can actually look at somebody and release them and say, you know what, you're good, man, go on. I'm still dealing with some pain. I'm still dealing with hurt, but how? Or even why I should. I mean, go back to Joe on the street here for a second. Why should I forgive? Well, that's what Jesus is going to teach us today. Okay, in the context here in Matthew 18, we've jumped ahead a little bit in this, in this study, but in Matthew 18, Jesus is addressing various kingdom teachings, right? He's, he's hitting on this, this, and the other, and then he comes to this aspect of forgiveness. Look with me in verse 15. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven." Four or two or three are gathered in my name. There I am among them. Now, this is a, a, a teaching of Jesus we often kind of rip out of context a little bit, and we use it to say, oh, if you see a brother in sin, boy, we got to go to him. That's not actually what he's saying here. He said, if a brother has sinned against you, if this is a personal offense, someone has come and sinned against you, now it's time to go and make it right with them. This is a personal grievance he's talking about here. Now, it's not... I mean, it's not unbiblical. I mean, other places we get the church, we do hold each other accountable. Okay, don't misunderstand me. But this text is primarily teaching about a conflict between two believers. 
right? This is what's happening here. Now notice, it's not the one who offended who goes, it's the one who is offended who goes. In other words, Jesus is teaching here, we're going to unpack this in a minute, but Jesus is actually teaching about a radical desire to forgive. I mean, it's the one who goes, hey man, I want to forgive you. Let's get this thing right. I want to come to you and I want to settle accounts with you. I want, to, I want us to be good again. I'm the one feeling pain, but I'm coming to you. That's what Jesus is teaching here. Now, this teaching would have rocked their minds. The first century culture was more obsessed with status than ours is. I mean, think about that one for a second. This culture, if you served salad that wasn't the right temperature, they would gossip about you all over the place because your life was ruined. If you ran out of wine at your wedding, your life would be ruined. You see those types of things happen in their culture. Why? Because they were so obsessed with status and the way people viewed them. And yet here Jesus is saying, if someone offends you, you don't write them off. You don't go over here and say, oh my goodness, they're, oh, I'm getting away from them. He says you take steps to try to reconcile first. You practice a radical forgiveness. You go after them. And if they're, if they're like, no, nah, I don't think I did anything wrong. I'm, I'm, no, no, man, we're, we're, I'm, I'm not receiving your forgiveness. Because then you take two more with you. And say, hey guys, we got to make this right. Hey, this is what I was feeling. Let's make this right. And this brought Peter's world to the point where Peter looks at Jesus and he thinks he's being all righteous. Okay, look at verse 23, or verse 21 rather. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Peter needs to read seven ways to pray for the offending brother. <laughs> but Peter thinks he's being really generous here. He's like, can I just forgive the guy seven times? Boy, that'd be great. And Jesus is like, no, 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 Peter, you're missing the point. He goes on in verse 22. Jesus said to him, I don't say to you seven times, but 77 times. 70 times seven. 70 zillion times, 70 zillion. The point Jesus is making is not that you keep count 490 times, then we're done. He's saying you lavishly forgive and you don't keep score. That's what he's getting at. Guys, in our churches, in your families, in your relationships with the body of Christ, with your family, with coworkers, with wherever it may be, we must practice a culture of radical forgiveness. Now, I said here, and we mentioned that many of us don't forgive because we don't know how and we don't really understand why. So this morning, let's dive into Jesus' teaching here. We're going to see why we must forgive why we must forgive, then we'll get to practical steps of how. Now you say, wait a minute, Joey, jump to the how, man. I mean, yeah, if, I miss the why, if we miss the why, you're not going to have any power or motivation behind the how, right? We have to understand the whole picture of forgiveness because this is what Jesus is teaching. There's more to it than just an activity. There's a heart here. There's a passion here. There's a desire here. There's a reflection here. And there is a reason behind why and how we must forgive, so what Jesus does to answer Peter, he gives him a parable. All right, now we're going to dive into the parables later on in the study really big, but uh, for right now, we're going to hit this one. And Jesus gives him a parable that basically unpacks the verses we just read. Okay, and we're going to see a lot of people don't connect those. We should connect them to get the whole picture. But Peter says, well, okay, how do I do this? Jesus gives a parable. And as we go through this, I want you to consider yourself for a second. Because I believe... Every one of us in this room needs to forgive someone. We've all got something in here that's just burdening us. Something in here that's just that person. And we need to make that right today. So let's see why we must forgive. And, and, and then we'll understand how to fully forgive as Jesus the teacher commands. So reason number one, we have been forgiven. <laughs> that's the reason number one. That's the big reason. I mean, here's what the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 3. We're taught that we forgive one another because Christ has forgiven us. It has nothing to do with whether they're really sorry or not. It has nothing to do with whether they've made it up to us or not or can't. We forgive others because God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. That's the whole motivation. Look at verse, um, the, the parable goes this way, verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Notice the king is the one who wants to settle the accounts, right? The king is the one going to settle the accounts here. He wants to make it right with those who owe him a debt. So in verse 24, when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10 
10,000 talents. And since he could not pay his master, offered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. Okay, hold up. This, the, the scene is the king is here and he's got, he wants to settle accounts. So he brings this guy in and this guy owes 10,000 talents. In the Greek, Greek numbering system back in this time period, they didn't have a number bigger than 10,000. They couldn't have, uh, that's why you get in the scripture 10,000 times 10,000, things like that. They didn't have a bigger number. And so here's Jesus telling these people, this guy owed 10,000 talents. That equates to right around 150,000 years worth of wages. There wasn't that much money in all of Israel. That's how much this guy owes. And he goes before the king. Uh, uh, the king's like, oh, you owe me like 150,000 years worth of work, dude. And the dude's like, I will pay you. I'm going to deny death and live 150,000 years and pay you off. And by the way, in that time period, I will not eat. I will not buy new clothing. I will not do anything that will cost money. It all goes to you. Boy, don't we make deals with God like that. Oh God, I will, I will do whatever I can to please you. Oh God, I will go to church. Oh God, I will tithe. Oh God, I will, I will bless people in the highways and the byways. I will be a good Christian. And what are you going to bring to him when our debt is an eternal sin against an eternal God? What are we going to offer him when he owns everything? What are we going to bring to him when our sins and offenses have come before him? What are we going to bring? That's what he's getting at here. Guys, we needed forgiveness too. And our gracious king desired to settle the debt. And so here's what the king does. Look at the next verse there. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. Wow, we have been forgiven of a debt that we could never repay. And when we realize, church, here, when we realize the magnitude of what we owed God and he frankly forgave it, how can we withhold that from other people? And that's where the New Testament chimes in on this idea of forgiveness. We don't forgive because we are good and mighty. We do not forgive because we're over pain. We do not forgive because they are sorry or they have changed. We don't forgive for those reasons. We forgive because God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. That's the motivation for forgiveness. We have been forgiven. Secondly, forgiveness reflects the kingdom. Forgiveness reflects the kingdom. Guys, as we are, remember Jesus is teaching us about life in the kingdom. Forgiveness reflects that life. We are to be a people of forgiveness. We are to be a culture of forgiveness and love that reflects the very mercy of God. The kingdom is built upon forgiveness. Therefore, forgiveness is a kingdom matter. Notice in the previous verses there, we were supposed to bring the whole church into it if forgiveness is becoming a problem. We bring the entire church into it. Forgiveness is a kingdom matter. We have a culture that is Christ's, and we are living that kingdom. How can we reflect something that is not of his kingdom? Notice in the next verses, here's what this servant does. Okay, check this out. Verse 28, but when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. That's about three months' wages, okay? That is not insignificant. I mean, how many of you would love to have to pay somebody in one lump sum three months of your wages, all right? It's not insignificant. Therefore, Jesus is not trying to say that our pain isn't bad. He's not trying to say that all oh, your hurts are blah, blah, He's not saying that at all. Guys, we hurt. I get that. We are in pain because of something somebody else has done. I get that. But re remember the magnitude Remember, we're reflecting a kingdom. And so here's what this servant does. The fellow, uh, he, began, he seized him. He began to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him the same way, have patience with me and I will pay you. Now, this is a reality. He probably could pay it. Yeah, three months. I mean, let's, let's get on a payment plan. We'll do some, maybe not interest, but whatever. Let's, let's work this out. But he refused in verse 30. And he went to put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Put him in prison until he should pay the debt. This guy did not reflect the kingdom. You see, guys, when we forgive, we are extending the very mercy God has given to us. We're showing the kingdom. The mercy God has shown us and the great debt we owed, we are passing that on to someone else. Like I said, sometimes people don't realize the pain that they have done. 
And the act of forgiveness, when we forgive someone else, it releases the forgiveness of God into their lives. That's what Jesus was getting at when he talked about this binding and loosing. Somehow or another, we always equate that with spiritual warfare. Nowhere does the text do that. The text, even when Jesus told Peter a couple of chapters ago that I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom, in the Greek and in some English translations, it's even worded, what has been bound in heaven is bound on earth. What has been loosed in heaven is loosed on earth. In other words, what is bound in heaven is sin and hatred and bitterness. We'll get more to that in a minute. What is loosed on the earth is forgiveness, love, compassion, the power of the gospel. And when we share our forgiveness... What God has given to us. We're extending the mercy that God has given. And sometimes, even Jesus back in Matthew 5 flips the script on this. And it's not the offend, it's not the the, the one who is offended going, it's the offender. He says, if you realize that you have something against another brother and somebody's got something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. Don't even worship me yet, but rather go and make it right. Why? Because, church, we don't leave each other in pain. We're not supposed to. Even if we're still bearing the pain, as Jesus bore a pain on the cross to forgive us, sometimes we have to bear that pain too to reflect the mercy of the kingdom. But God rewards that. Forgiveness is a faith matter about the sufficiency of the cross. It's not about what we can muster. We're reflecting the kingdom, guys. And what I mean by this is we typically and love to rejoice in the fact that God has forgiven me, that all my sin was laid on Jesus at the cross, But you know what else that means? That means you. All of your sin is also on Christ at the cross, which means your sin against me has already been born too. And that's where we get back into this thing. We're reflecting the kingdom. I'm simply reminding you when you sin against me, I am reminding you in my forgiveness that Christ has also forgiven you. We've got to reflect the kingdom, church. We, when we don't forgive each other, we're acting in a way that is inconsistent with the kingdom. Inconsistent with what Christ has done for us. And don't you make a mistake in thinking those on the outside don't notice. We've got to act in a way that is consistent. We are to be people who embrace and practice forgiveness with the aim of restoration. But when, bless you, when we don't, when we don't, We miss out on part three here. We must forgive because we've been forgiven, because forgiveness reflects the kingdom, and lastly, because forgiveness sets us free. Forgiveness sets us free. Look at what what happens to this guy next, okay? Verse 32. Then the master, or, or verse 31, when his fellow servants saw the thing that had taken place, this is where you get two or three are gathered, and then you get them all before the church, right? He goes on to say, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And the master summoned him and said, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you. If you do not from Uh, Forgive your brother from the heart. What? Forgiveness opens the door to a deeper awareness of our relationship with God. Here's what I mean. The Mayo Clinic, read you a few more reports, because I researched this, you need to know it, okay? In a Mayo Clinic report, holding a grudge can lead you to become wrapped up in the wrong to the point that you miss out on the present. In other words, you're so wrapped up in this thing that happened to you, you're missing life in the present. And this is Mayo Clinic saying this, you will feel at odds with your spiritual beliefs as well as lose other valuable and enriching connections with people who didn't hurt you. Wow. What's he mean? What do they mean by that? Bitterness even hurts and makes you feel at odds with your spiritual beliefs. Like I said, we act in a way that is inconsistent with the gospel when we do not forgive. How do you think we're going to walk in this and have a relationship with God that is thriving and growing? How do we think we can? In fact, what Jesus says about this guy, he's thrown into the uh, the, the, the prison and will be tormented. And they say, why would God torment me when I'm the one that got hurt? Yeah, why would God do? It's not that God is tormenting you. 
That's not the problem here. The problem is that you're not forgiving and you're left in that state of bitterness. Johns Hopkins, again, chimes in. People who hang on to grudges, however, are more likely to experience severe depression and even PTSD when other things kind of trigger it back out. Understand this. And what Jesus is teaching here, the reason we so aggressively pursue forgiveness is because your unforgiveness is hurting you more than the offense did. And when we refuse that forgiveness, we bind ourselves to the tormentors. And he says, you won't be released until you pay the debt you owe. What is the debt we owe? Mercy. That is the debt we owe. We owe it to extend mercy. So stop refusing what God so freely empowers us to do. Because the act of forgiveness sets us free. It's been well said, it's a cliche, I know, but I'm gonna say it anyway, that whenever we, whenever we forgive, we open the prison doors and find that the prisoner was us, right? But that is true. And that's what Jesus is getting at. We must extend the same thing. Guys, listen to this. We, we guard our physical health through screening, through good diet, we guard all that. Why would we not guard our emotional and our spiritual health as well? Why wouldn't we guard that? And a way to guard that is to give forgiveness. Johns Hopkins even says you can learn to be more forgiving. They say it's an active process in which you make a conscious decision to let go of negative feelings, whether the person deserves it or not. That's what they say. As you release the anger, resentment, and hostility, you begin to feel empathy, compassion, and sometimes even affection for the person who wronged you. You know, it's kind of fun when psychology and medical and all these things catch up to what the Bible's been teaching for thousands of years. It is possible to love your offender. It is possible to release those feelings. It is possible to get on with your life after you're damaged. But how? The kingdom is about reflecting Jesus. We operate in his power and his glory. So let's see how we can fully forgive somebody, guys. Let's look at this. How do we, how do we fully forgive? Number one, resolve to be obedient to Christ. Resolve to be obedient to Jesus. Guys, this is where we start. Man, we gotta start by saying, Jesus, I desire to obey you. You know, it's not about what we're feeling inside. It's about being obedient to what he commands us to do. Right? I love that part in scripture where this dude comes to Jesus seeking healing and, uh, for his, his, his kid. And Jesus says, do you believe I can do this? He goes, Lord, I really want to believe. Will you help my unbelief? Sometimes we need to pray, Lord, I want to obey you and be obedient to you. Help me forgive. Help me come to that point. This starts with an obedience to Jesus. Many times we come to church, we raise our hands, we say, I will do whatever God commands. How about forgive? Because that's what he commands and at no point in your life are you reflecting him more than, we forgive, than when we forgive someone who doesn't deserve it. So resolve to be obedient to him. Secondly, find the storyline. This one's fun. Find the storyline. Tim Keller, in a, a brilliant sermon he preached right after 9-11, makes the comment, you cannot make sense of things until you find the storyline. You know, sometimes we forget that even in an offense... God's got a plan, and God's working through something. So we've got to find the storyline and what this offense is and how God is working it, much like Joseph did when he told his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. We need to find that, and here's how. Make a list. I'm a list guy. Make your list. What happened? What happened? Be direct with it. Don't sugarcoat it. What happened? Secondly, how did it feel? Well, how did that make you feel, right? How did it feel when we're getting the storyline here? How did it feel? Why did it hurt? Why did that hurt me so badly? You're going to find it probably wasn't what they did so much as it was the heart behind it or how you interpreted it. Like it made me feel violated. It made me feel worthless. It made me feel, you see what I'm saying? You're going to find these types of things in that. How can God use this? That's the one we don't want to get to because we like our hurt, but the storyline God is writing in your life is never to destroy you, it is always to build you. That's the promise we have in Romans chapter eight, all things are working together for our good, right? This too, your pain too. What do we learn? How can God, let's play the what if game here for just a second. What, what could this story do? 
What could your testimony be as you begin to find what God does, as you begin to rediscover and find in Jesus what somebody took from you? What could happen? How could God begin to move? How could God finish this story? How could God? And start really looking into that and dream a little bit because you have the keys to the kingdom. What has been loosed in heaven is loosed on earth. That is forgiveness, restoration, mercy, and life after death. Joy after chaos, pleasure after pain. That's what our God does, even pleasure through it. Find that storyline. How's God work and where can God take it? Third, reevaluate your offender for a second. Reevaluate your offender. We're going to talk about the offender for a second. Let me ask you this What do they, what do they have to do for you to forgive them? What do they got to do? If they did it, would it matter? Would you forgive them? Let me go a little deeper here. Can they make it up to you? I think about Inigo Montoya. <laughs> when in the last moments, I'll do anything you ask, he goes, I want my father back. I won't finish. <laughs> Can he get his father back? No. Can they really give you back what they took? No. Can they really make it where that doesn't hurt? No, only Jesus can do that. And we're gonna find that most of the time we're putting on an offender things that they cannot deliver. We gotta let that go. How? Pray. Next thing is pray. Ask God for the strength. Ask God for more love. Pray that God will bless the offender. Wow, Joey, now just what Jesus told us to do too, guys. Pray for those who use you. Pray for those who hurt you. Pray for them. And we're not talking about imprecatory prayers where you're like, God, let bears come out of the woods and eat them. We're not talking about that stuff. Jesus said, pray the blessing. Pray for them. Ask God to soften the heart of your offender and soften your own heart as well. Recall your own forgiveness and mercy as you pray that God has given to you. And ask him for strength to give that to someone else. Next, manage your expectations. Manage your expectations. I'm not saying we're going to go be BFFs with the guy who offended you. I'm not saying that you're going to go and boy, it's going to... I'm not saying that. I'm not even saying it's not going to still hurt after you forgive. You know, forgiveness is, uh, forgiveness is like that old... Like a football injury, right? Uh, on a shoulder. Let's say you hurt your shoulder playing football. And, and in time, it's going to heal. Yo, you're going to be able to get out there and you're going to be able to do it again. But then on the rainy day, you know, it kind of hurts a little again. You know, it doesn't mean that you didn't forgive. It doesn't, it just means that we have an enemy who likes to come and poke at things. You just have to make the conscious decision to rub some Ben Gay on it and go on, right? Or Icy Hot or whatever the kids use. But that's the point. Manage those expectations, but understand healing comes. And lastly, talk it out. Talk it out. This is the hardest part, probably, is the, the talking it out, but this is what Jesus commands us to do. Go to your offender. What if I can't, Joey? What if they're dead? What if they, whatever else? I get that. Then go to someone you love and trust and just air it out and forgive there. You know? Now, by, by go and talk to somebody else, let me, let me clarify something. Do not gossip don't gossip. We're not there to, hey, how do I know if I'm gossiping, Joey? Well, did you name names unnecessarily? <laughs> you know? Number two, are you just trying to recruit people to validate you and feel, you know, is that what you're after? Are you trying to get them to hate that person too? Or to feel bad about that person too? That's gossiping. When we go to somebody and say, hey, how can I make this right with somebody? This is what I'm feeling. This is where the hurt was. How can I come to a place of forgiveness? That's talking it out. So that's what we focus on. But guys, I, I challenge you to do this because it is in keeping with the teaching of Jesus and what he's commanded us to do. Let's, let's bow our heads, close our eyes. I want to pray for you real quick. And I want to challenge you this minute. You know who you need to forgive. You know that. And you know the pain you know the hurt. You know what's happened. I want to invite you right now to pray. 
to ask Jesus to give you the strength you need to release that offense. If that's somebody in the room right now, go to them now. We've got people at our prayer stations right now in the back that you might need to go and say, I need some prayer to help me forgive. But take this very seriously because our God does. And allow him to work in your life through this forgiveness. Father, I thank you so much for the forgiveness you give us in Jesus. Now, Father, stir our hearts to give that forgiveness away. To give it to those around us. To strengthen those around us. To be set free from the bitterness that that grabs our hearts. Jesus, set us free today. And let a spirit of forgiveness be loosed in this place. That we can breathe again, Father. That we can find a joy in you again. That our bitterness is not, not keeping us from you and experiencing you and understanding the way you forgive us. Father, let your grace be upon us. As we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.